I was in the shop making a bunch of parts, as you can see, and I was looking at my print and it occurred to me, there is no GD&T on this print. No datums, no basic dimensions, no position tolerances, feature control for it, nothing. And I thought that's kind of strange for a guy who's an expert on that stuff. And I thought, you know what? I should make a video about this, why I'm not using any GD&T on these parts. Because you might be working with somebody who says you have to have it on every print under all conditions, and that's just not the case. So let me go over this. When anyone brings me a print and says, is this print correct? First thing I ask is, what is the part used for? What are you going to do with it? Well, this part is for another video I'm making for a completely other channel that I started with this uh, science entertainment kind of channel thing where I'm, I'm making all kinds of cool stuff. I've already got a couple of videos up I'm really proud of. I'll put the go to the show notes down below and if you want to go check those out and see the kind of stuff that I'm building. It's all it's got music, it's all fancy and entertainment and, and I think it's a lot of fun to watch. So check that stuff out. The next video that I'm going to post involves using two liter bottles where I'm going to uh, run a bunch of pressure up inside of it and I need to be able to store that pressure, get it in and out in a controlled manner. So I need something that I can screw a two liter bottle into and have it stay nice and sealed so I have access with a, a gas port down here and another one on that side so I can selectively get stuff in and out and I'm doing a bunch of them. I've got a bunch of bottles. This, this, it's going to be a lot of fun. So that's what it's for and you can see that's actually I'll have hoses and fittings and all that stuff attached to it. So if that's what I'm if that's what I'm doing, then we know that we have to have a thread that is going to fit the bottle. So I'd take all these measurements of the thread and put that into that was in fact that was the first thing that I put into the block. So in order to get that thing to seal right. So I, I, there's a bore that the seal is in. It's got to be the right size. And I made that the minor diameter of the thread. And then the thread has to, of course, be, if you think about the position of things, you want that bore that the seal is in and the, the V of the thread, the helical path of the thread, to be concentric. And yeah, I could call that out, make one of them a datum and the other one be position. But honestly, it's really not that critical. It's a plastic bottle that's going to flex a little bit as long as I make it big enough for all of the bottles to thread in and fit. It's you know it, it's it's going to work. And just imagine how far off of center this thing would have to be before the lip, the the leading edge of that bottle, wouldn't seal on that O-ring. I mean, it'd have to be way off. And going to the footage on the milling machine, the way I set that thing up, I did one operation where it was just doing the bore. And I did that for all of the parts. I took them in and out, dropped them in, cut that bore. Took the next one out, dropped another one in, cut the bore. And then set up the machine to do the thread milling and dropped them in one at a time and did that thread milling on, on all of them. Now, okay, how concentric are those things going to be? How aligned are those things going to be? Well, you'll notice each one of these parts has a little black dot on the end. And if you see in the footage, when I was first putting those into the vise, I put that little black dot to remind me which side was getting sat up against the stop on my vise. So, because you can imagine if this part isn't exactly to length, and I'm making this bore a certain distance from that face, and then I put it in there to do the bore one way, and then I, when I pick it up to flip it around the other way, it's going to be a different distance from that edge, and the inconsistency in the length is, is going to throw that around. So just by knowing that if I put it in the same way each time, it's going to be as accurate as the machine is capable of, just automatically 
makes those two features as concentric as the machine can can make it. So that's another one of those. Could I have called this out as a datum and this bottom surface as my primary, uh, secondary on the back, and then tertiary on this face and, and made it, marked it in some way on the print? Yeah, I could have, but that would have taken a bunch of time to do. And I knew what these were being used for. I knew the design requirements and I'm making it the whole way. So I just know as I'm building it, okay, this will be fine. And I mark it to be made that way. Now, as far as the depth, you know, that machine, it's a milling machine. It's capable of hitting that depth probably to a couple of thousands. This is a big squishy O-ring and ultimately I have the bottle seating up against that O-ring when you're tightening it in, just like a garden hose on the front of your house. You're, you're tightening it down. The resistance comes when you begin to run into that O-ring and I'll just tighten it till it's snug where it compresses the O-ring and gets a nice, uh, a nice seal. And finish, yeah, I could have called out the finish, but guess what? At the bottom of that, with a, running a nice end mill in there, it left a very nice finish in the bottom of each of these holes, and it's going to seal just fine for what I'm doing. No need to call that out, take the time to put it on the print. Now these uh, gas holes you'll notice that are in the bottom are you know, size. I just picked something. In fact, I picked something that was the same size as the mounting holes. I wanted the option of using a quarter inch bolt. So I picked a hole that was slightly bigger than a, I think it was 263. So it was bigger than a quarter inch bolt and said, you know what? I've got that drill out. I'll just make these uh, gas holes the same size and hmm, how far off center do I make them? And just when I model it up in CAD, I just looked at what would make sure it wasn't going to be undercutting the O-ring, you know, interfering with the seal on, on the bottom, and then the holes not interfering with each other, although that may not be a, a really big deal in the design. So when I made those holes, I went ahead and used a center drill to locate them really precisely and then came back with the, with the drill because it's a long skinny drill. But again, what are the consequences of being out of position by even 20 thousandths or 30 thousandths on these holes? It's not really going to change the design much. As long as there's a passage there for the air and water to get in and out, it's going to work. It's going to be fine. So lined up and, and did that operation on all of them as well. Uh, let's see. So the threaded holes where the fittings are going to go, Pretty much the same thing. How far off, given that diameter, that thing would have to be, I don't know, a couple of millimeters, eighth of an inch or something off before it ever really seriously started to affect the flow. It's not like I'm uh, requiring this thing to have a certain flow rate to meet a certain time or, or anything like that. So it could be one way or the other, it's not a big deal. And that's why when I made these, yeah, I. I started on the one side with the black mark up against the stop on the vise, but when I went to the other side, you'll see, I just flip it over and drill it. And so if even if my part length was off by an eighth of an inch and everything was made a, a fixed distance from that, I will say, datum surface here, you can imagine, say, if it was even an, an eighth of an inch off, it's still going to do its job. And I know this was, uh, this was bar stock dimension on the outside. I split the difference. That's probably made to a thou or two, especially when these all came out of the same piece of bar stock. So another piece of knowledge when you're making these things, designing it yourself, making it yourself, and you're the end user, you can look at the stock you've got around and make judgment calls and go, yeah, this, this will work just fine. And yeah, do they work? Yeah, it works great. When I thread this thing in here, I can pressurize one of the hoses and the, uh, make sure I get that thing fully seated. Oh, it was going in just fine. Uh, yeah, I can pressurize one of these and block the other and it, it holds in air. I mean, we'll find out when I hit it with 100 PSI and start doing all kinds of stuff with it, how, how good the seal is. But yeah, it looks like it's gonna work just fine. So to recap, this is kind of like one of those, you, the, the Jeff Fox where you might be a redneck if, well, you might not G, need GD&T if 
you are the designer. You design the part. You are the manufacturer. You are building it. You are inspecting it. And you are the end user. You have everything. It's a closed loop within you. Then, yeah, maybe you don't need the GD&T because you're able to make trade-offs through the entire process and as you're making it and you're running, because I had little goofs when I made these things, like, hmm, can I live with this little uh, error in the, in the thread that I had because I had an issue with my boring bar? Yeah, I just check the fit. Yep, it works just fine. I, I can make those calls without having to ask any questions or need something referenced on the print. Uh, this is probably the most important one. You might not need GD&T if your equipment is far more precise than the design requires. So in this case, yeah, it's an old milling machine from the 1960s, but it's capable of hitting a, a thousandth or two or a couple of hundredths of a millimeter day in and day out. It's no problem. This design does not require that. I, I could be off by ten thousandths, twenty thousandths on almost all of these features. The thing's still going to go together and work. So when the equipment can just make rel relative to the accuracy you need when the qu equipment is a fraction of that, you may not need GD&T. Just let the equipment do its job. That's where you get into that, that process capability, CPK, all that, if you want to look into it. Um, you might not need GD&T if you are aware of all of the critical features and can address those as you're going through it. You don't need to be told by the print, oh, this is a plus or minus one, this is a plus or minus two. Ah, you just need nominal and you can control it with the process. Uh, you might not need GD&T if you design the process around the requirements of the part with how you hold it. Kind of like I marked the one side to make sure that every time I fixtured it, I was fixturing it the same way to give the most consistency on those features. Um, you might not need GD&T if you really don't even have another option that would be any better. So let's say that milling machine wasn't good enough. Uh, I mean, I could, I guess I could make it on, try to chuck this up on my lathe and do it, but I, I don't want to. So if the mill isn't good enough, I don't have another option to go to. So I'm just going to make it work with this process. And if there was a call out on here that said I had to hit to a half a thou position, I'm like, well, too bad. That's not, <laughs> I don't have that as an option. <laughs> Uh, and you might not need GD&T if it's just a prototype that you're building to see if the thing can work. You're just testing it out, finding out what the bigger issues are, and if it's easy to do and quick for this prototype thing, and it turns out that when you try it, it works, hey, I guess I didn't need the GD&T. So advantages of doing it this way, you can tell instantly when you're working on a part, whether it's scrap or if it can be used. I just like, whoops, I messed up something. Can I still work on it? One of these had a, I touched a spot. Uh, there it is right there. I accidentally was, was, uh, got my axes mixed up as I, and made a little mark in the back. Doesn't matter. That's just the surface that's going to be mounted on. So I knew that instantaneously that, uh, that it was a, still a good part that it could be used, even though that was frustrating. Uh, another advantage, I don't have to waste extra time going over the print with every nitty gritty little detail that somebody might need to know. Um, uh, I get, like I said before, I don't need to, I don't need to ask questions of what will and won't be okay because I'm the, all the way from the designer to the end user, I can answer those questions on the fly. No finish call outs and hey, no work instructions either because I'm not having to pass that knowledge on to anyone. It's all right in the person making it. Now, disadvantages of not putting all those details on the print, and there are plenty, and they are substantial. No one else knows how to make this thing. I doesn't matter how skilled the machinist is or tool and die maker. I bring him into my shop and say, yeah, make that. And they go, uh, what do you need? They're basically going to be forced to make all the dimensions as perfectly to nominal as they can because there's no real indication of how far off of center that they can go. Uh, let's see what else. The This doesn't scale well. I can't farm it out. I can't say, let's say I make that video and somebody calls me up and says, man, that's fantastic. I want 10,000 of those for my entire school district 
can you, how much do you want for them? Like, uh, I can't farm. I mean, I guess I could farm this printout, but the confidence that I would have in actually getting what I need would be kind of low unless I know the people and I worked at that shop and I maybe give them a, a, a handshake of, yeah, d just follow plus or minus this and you'll be fine. But then we're violating the idea of the print. Every, the idea is everything's supposed to be on there so I can just send that print out. I don't have to talk to the person and it's, it's all met. So the way it is, I, I can't do that. And last but not least, if I have to go make more of these, let's say a year down the road, I want to build more of them. I have to remember all that stuff. I have to dig through this design and, and maybe figure it out as if it were the first time again. Let's see what, how important is this depth? How important is that thread? How loose did I make it? Whereas if it were on the print, I wouldn't have to ask that question. I can just follow zip. You know what? When they were made to print before, they worked and everything is locked down. It's a fully constrained design and it gives me confidence that I can just jump on it and build it to print. But for what I'm doing, for the quantity that I'm handling, it's, it's a lot more fun. It's a lot quicker for me just to jump on it, build them up and rely on a combination of the knowledge of what my equipment is capable of and what the the really low design requirements are for this and for the few features like where the o-ring sits and everything like yep i just intuitively know that it's going to be able to handle it now something i want to address is that uh, supporters of this channel people who have donated uh, made a separate donation or purchased a study guide off of my website were the first to get this video they got it a week ahead of everybody else and thank you again to those people who have been so generous with this channel. I don't think I would be able to continue doing it like I have uh, without those. If you want to be part of that group to get some of these early releases and help support the channel, uh, look in the show notes. You can find where you can donate or, yeah, go download that study guide. I put a ton of effort into it. Even if you just peek at it and go through and, and get a cursory view of it, I'm, I'm sure you'll benefit from it. So uh, that's all for now, and I'll see you in the next video.